Hi, everyone. I know it's been a while, but we're excited to share with you today's presentation on the future of the U.S.-Japan relations under President-elect Joe Biden. We're honored to welcome special guest and former ambassador to the United States from Japan, His Excellency Ichido Fujisaki. Please don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. We look forward to sharing new insights, content, and commentary on these critical emerging issues further in 2021. Please stay tuned. I'd like to welcome those participating in Japan, elsewhere in Asia, in North America, and around the world to this webinar presentation on the future of US-Japan relations under President Biden. I am Dana Marshall, founder and president of Transnational Strategy Group, an international business and government affairs consultancy headquartered here in Washington. We are pleased to join with our partner, Langley Esquire, a public relations consultancy and public affairs consultancy based in Tokyo in presenting this event. And I'll turn the floor, uh, the floor over to uh, Timothy Langley. Tim. Thank you, Dana. Good morning to everyone in Tokyo and good evening to those of you who are, who are joining us from the United States and elsewhere. We're really in an exciting time at the cusp of the incoming Biden administration and of course the challenging geopolitical climate in which we find ourselves. As many of you already know, Langley Esquire is a Tokyo-based public affairs and international business consultancy. We focus on the intersection between business and politics in Japan and are particularly engaged in government relations, strategic communications, and market entry support for disruptive technologies, innovative solutions, and trade and development projects involving sensitive regulatory challenges. We craft unique solutions tailored to meet our clients' needs across industry sectors, including technology, energy, healthcare, and beyond. What interesting times we're living in. President-elect Joe Biden will face numerous challenges and opportunities as he enters office. How will he approach relations towards other Asian governments? Today, we'll focus on the U.S.-Japan relationship, sometimes referred to as the relationship, and we're honored to be joined by two expert speakers on this subject. It's my pleasure to introduce former ambassador of Japan to the United States, Ichido Fujisaki, and transnational strategy group practice lead for Japan in Northeast Asia, Dr. Thomas Sinken. Ichido Fujisaki was a Japanese diplomat who served as ambassador to the United States from 2008 to 2012, and he possesses just a tremendous wealth of experience in foreign affairs and international relations. He's currently president of the Nakasone Peace Institute and the America Japan Society. He was also ambassador to the United Nations and to the World Trade Organization in Geneva, serving as chairman of the executive committee of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. From 1995 to 1999, he worked in Washington, D.C. as the political minister for the Embassy of Japan. His other Ministry of Foreign Affairs posts include terms as Deputy Director General of, for Asian Affairs and Director General for North American Affairs before being appointed as Deputy Foreign Minister. He's studied at Keio University, Brown University, and at Stanford Graduate School. Dr. Thomas Sinken is practice lead for Japan and Northeast Asia at Transnational Strategy Group, a global business and government affairs consultancy. Dr. Sinken is an acknowledged authority on Japan and broader Asian affairs. As a foreign service officer, he served seven years as a diplomat in Japan and was Asian affairs advisor to two deputy secretaries of state and to two U.S. ambassadors to the United Nations. He also previously headed the Washington, D.C. office of Fujitsu as chief corporate representative, vice president, and general manager. Dr. Sinken has also served as a member of the board of directors and executive committee of the Information Technology Industry Council. It's a trade association for Fortune 50 tech companies. He is a regular contributor to the Japan Times and Cypher Brief. Concurrently, he is Director of Development and External Affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service in Washington, D.C. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our speakers. Ambassador Fujisaki, what observations can you share with us on the future of the U.S.-Japan relationship? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, American friends that uh, election is almost over. I hope uh, President Trump is not listening. Uh, during the election, I was always saying that uh, if asked uh, from Japanese friends uh, which side uh, Japan should favor, oh, it's like an American Christmas gift. You don't say anything till the day and on the day. You would just open the box and cry out, oh, this is just what I wanted. 
And, but this time, I think it's really uh, very good, not only for the United States, but for the world, because we needed Americans to be back. And uh, American leadership is so important. Uh, we'll collaborate with Americans in the multilateral scene. Uh, in talking about US-Japan relations, uh, just I like to talk about leaders, uh, security, economic uh, relations, and people to people. Uh, as for leaders, uh, as you know very well, that Abe, Prime Minister Abe, uh, managed uh, relations with Mr. Trump uh, really uh, genially. And uh, I, I think he learned a lot from Mr. Koizumi. Uh, when he was serving for Mr. Koizumi in cabinet. The knack is not to preach, not to ask favor. And I think uh, three M's of Europe, Merkel, Macron, and May, uh, didn't uh, do that very well. They tried to teach Mr. Trump what democracy is very openly, that's humiliating. And I think it's very natural that uh, they didn't develop good relations. Also, not only leaders, but Japanese people who are other cultures. For example, when uh, Mr. Trump came to Japan, uh, there was no demonstrations at all. Suga-san, uh, uh, talk a bit about him. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, Western media made a mistake, uh, just uh, echoing maybe Japanese press, but uh, saying that Oh, he will faithfully step, uh, follow the steps of uh, Mr. Abe. Second, uh, he has no diplomatic experience, foreign policy experience, so he has to learn. Now, about that, uh, uh, they don't understand Japanese sort of psychology. The second man or third man, when he wants to be first man, the number one, he never shows his uh, ambition. And when he was named, he would, has to play as he was very much astounded. Me? Not me. But uh, that's the only way he can become the number one. That's the Japanese style. And he will, he will say, I will follow the step, then next day he will change it. That's the, uh, <laughs> what uh, I think Suga-san is doing as well. Second thing, he has, of course, uh, very little experience uh, in foreign policy, but it, of course, his uh, role was White House Chief of Staff. Uh, they don't go out that much, it's same, but uh, they keep everything uh, in the hand, so he knows everything about it. Now, uh, people-to-people -people relationship, uh, I think uh, 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 it's very good, but uh, one thing I have, uh, the Americans have to be careful, I think, is that uh, this time, thanks to Abe, uh, people uh, had a... Uh, uh, so good U.S.-Japan relations have continued, but uh, in 2016, uh, Mr. Trump said, uh, hey, uh, we're going to pull out of Japan and Japan can go nuclear if uh, they want. Uh, that was during the election time. Uh, he 180 degrees changed his position, but if those things come out in, again and again from American politicians, Amer Japanese will start feeling, hey, can we really depend on Americans? This is very uh, important issue you have to think about. Now, uh, I have spoken leader and people. So thirdly, I will uh, pick up the 10 points very quickly on uh, Japan-US relations uh, regarding Japan. One is uh, US-China. Uh, many experts say that uh, because of military and uh, technology competition, uh, the uh, confrontation will continue. I'm rather doubtful about that because uh, uh, the sign from uh, both sides, uh, because during the election time, of course, you have to take very tough stance uh, uh, towards China. But uh, uh, on democratic platform, they say that they would not try to get into Cold War with China. Very clearly, that's a July uh, platform of Democratic Party. And uh, from China as well, there's a sign. Uh, in August, uh, Foreign Minister Wan Yi said uh, four principles. No confrontation, dialogue, no decoupling, no zero sum game. And uh, in November, Huin, the uh, deputy foreign minister, has written on New York Times that there should be collaborative competition. And so I think uh, we in Japan should anticipate that there could be some change. And uh, the two ways of change, I think, one is that uh, the United States will ask. Uh, uh, the democratic parties to join in 
not only U.S. alone, but uh, join in the line or camp to uh, compete. Uh, uh, that, that's one thing. And the second thing is that Americans would just try to improve their relations. And I think we have to be ready for those thinking as well. North Korea, second point. Uh, uh, it says in diplomat platform that this will be uh, given to uh, negotiators, uh, but also says that uh, humanitarian aid should be considered. And uh, I remember that in Clinton administration, uh, United States was using food aid as a tool of the market uh, of uh, negotiations. And uh, so we have been focusing only on sanctions, but uh, these things could come up. The third point is uh, the US forces. Uh, and I think uh, this time in the Biden administration, it'll be not asking for four times or whatever those huge numbers, but uh, normal negotiation uh, uh, will uh, be started. Uh, uh, fourth, uh, on TPP, I don't anticipate that there'll be a big move on that. Uh, fourth, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, uh, fifth, uh, on RCEP, uh, I think uh, we just started RCEP, uh, uh, ASEAN plus uh, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, uh, we missed India. Now, this is, uh, 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 I think, uh, uh, we miss it very much. And of course, the uh, uh, United States is not in it. And uh, I hope that uh, this will not become a political platform. Uh, maybe China would like to make it, but we have to be very careful. Fifth, uh, sixth uh, is uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, uh, Maybe Biden uh, would not like to use that word because that's a Trump word, uh, but uh, what's important is not the wording, it's more substance and quad, uh, US, Japan, Australia, India. Uh, can we continue and even expand it? Expand it to, for example, Korea and Indonesia and those countries. If we could do that, I think that's uh, uh, more important than that word. The uh, seventh uh, uh, missile, uh, Aegis Ashore issue is now uh, has uh, get, uh, getting shape that uh, I think uh, and, and, and the Japanese side is thinking of uh, <clears throat> having some more capability of the long range missile. And uh, that uh, may or may not change uh, strategic scene. Uh, uh, all in all, division of labor between US uh, having the offensive role and Japan having defensive role uh, does not change, but uh, we have to uh, look at that carefully. Uh, eighth, uh, ASEAN. Uh, uh, Trump administration has not uh, looked at, uh, didn't really watch at ASEAN and didn't uh, send an ambassador to ASEAN. Uh, this, uh, which is very different from Obama administration. And I think uh, for United States interest, uh, they should, because ASEAN could be a very important friend to United States, they should put more emphasis on ASEAN. Uh, last uh, ninth, uh, Japan, Korea, South Korea. Uh, some people in Japan is uh, uh, concerned that, hey, US uh, may ask uh, uh, us to, uh, sort of uh, uh, make uh, the relations uh, a better in, uh, relations with that uh, career. I think uh, that could happen, but what's important is that uh, uh, these relations between Japan and Korea should be solved by those two countries. And uh, we will, should do that. Uh, uh, and I think there's some sign, uh, Koreans uh, may be moving as well. So because uh, uh, no Americans would be very happy if Japanese uh, uh, Prime Minister or Foreign Minister would go to Washington and say, hey, I would like to try to improve your relations with Mexico or Canada. So uh, uh, I think we should uh, try to do that by ourselves. Lastly, uh, there's a multilateral uh, platform like uh, WTO, WTO, United Nations and all that. Uh, very happy that in, uh, the Biden administration tries to go back to these uh, with Paris as well. and. Uh, improve them from within, not just get out and criticize, but try to improve them. I think all of these organizations needs 
a lot of needs, a lot of uh, improvement. For example, we, I was astounded by the behavior of WHO director. We have to really review them, critically analyze that, but uh, you should stay and utilize WTO. Uh, this is uh, or uh, WHO or United Nations. Uh, these are very quickly uh, uh, what's uh, coming up in Japan-US relations. Uh, it's, the time is limited, so it's a little shallow analysis, but I just wanted to give you food for thought. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. A little shallow analysis, you say. Well, that was a, a terrific briefing on really what the standing is and what's at risk in the um, in the, the change of the relationship. But thank you, delivered with warmth and humor as, uh, as we've come to expect from you. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Thomas Sinken to give us a perspective. Thomas, you are in Washington, DC. You've been involved in the relationship at a very deep level for a long time. What's the feel here um, with the relationship from the, the US perspective? Well, uh, thank you, Tim. And uh, um, good morning to everybody in, in Japan and good evening to all our friends in, in the United States. And I'm Tom Sinken. I'm uh, the Director of Development and External Affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at its Washington, D.C. Uh, teaching site, which is brand new. Please come visit us. And I'm uh, very pleased to be affiliated with the Transnational Strategy Group at, under uh, Dana's fine leadership as well. And it's an honor also to appear uh, with Ambassador Fujisaki, although it is, he is always a difficult act to follow but I shall do my best. Um, well, um, to uh, respond to your question, Tim, um, there is a, sort of a, a legacy of the Obama administration, which I think will carry over and some of that positive and some of that negative, given that there's a lot of people who will be kind of recycled from the old Obama team. I mean, uh, President-elect Biden included. Um, you know, the Obama administration um, was careful in dealing with Japan, but it wasn't necessarily as friendly as some would have hoped. I think there was meticulous and careful management of the relationship, both in Washington and Tokyo, but there were also, uh, you know, accusations of Japan passing um, and uh, some other uh, difficulties that arose in the relationship, I would say. Uh, for example, you know, um, thinking about the Obama administration, the pivot to Asia, which many reviewed as really more of a pivot away from the Middle East than having much impact on Asia. The um, uh, unfortunate strategic patience policy towards North Korea that was uh, unsuccessful, regrettably. Um, and, uh, you know, basically also what many regard as a accommodationist policy towards China. Um, now, do I expect that that would continue I don't think so at all, because I mean, the correlation of strategic forces has, uh, in the intervening years, shifted uh, more in China's direction. And uh, the Obama team, the Democratic Party, um, the Senate, I think is more aware of this, and the China challenge really dominates the headlines. Uh, I, fo I thought, uh, for example, that uh, uh, President-elect Biden's rather quick affirmation that Article 5 of the Mutual Defense Treaty would apply to the Senkaku Islands was a very encouraging sign and showed that he intends to treat the relationship very seriously. So I'm not so concerned, as some have said, that we may face more Japan passing. I really don't think so. Uh, new emphases in the Biden administration. <clears throat> well, first of all, it's obviously much more multilaterally focused, which I think would be welcome news in Tokyo and in other capitals of our allies and friends. Um, now, what are the implications of that? Well, you know, the team, again, if you look at them, they're multilateral uh, internationalists in a, in a positive sense. Um, but I agree with Ambassador Fujisaki that there is no prospect for a rapid uh, return to what is now the CPTPP. And uh, that's a legacy in part of uh, the campaign uh, in which uh, Hillary Clinton felt obliged to switch from being a supporter of the TPP, indeed one of the architects to opposing it, uh, largely because of uh, you know, concerns by organized labor 
And uh, those concerns still exist among organized labor, uh, which views a, a lot of these types of treaties with uh, suspicion. And they're an important element of the Democratic Party support. So that could be an issue that keeps the United States outside of CPTPP for some time, unless uh, President-elect Biden as president chooses to spend real political capital. And I don't think that's his top priority coming in. Uh, despite the fact, the threat you should, you should uh, maybe characterize it as, of um, the gravitational pull of China on all its neighbors, economically, politically. And now, you know, RCEP, which leaves the United States on the sidelines, um, with the, uh, the heft that China gets politically, as well as economically from its Belt and Road Initiative, you know, it seems to scream for the need to bolster uh, the CPTPP. And we can look at uh, former Prime Minister Abe with that, nothing but admiration for having kept that afloat. But, and I would certainly hope the US would find a way of, of getting into the game uh, and playing the multilateral trade game. And after all, you know, CPTPP is, is a higher quality organization, one could say, or arrangement than RCEP. But um, it'll take political will to get there. Um, now, I was at a roundtable discussion with a prominent progressive Democratic senator um, a little over a month ago who was uh, taking pains to emphasize that his colleagues in the Senate um, really share the threat perception vis-a-vis -vis China that the Trump administration has, although they may differ substantially in how to address it. So we're not going to see, I'm quite certain, um, you know, a, a senior administration official flying to Beijing with a cake in the shape of a reset button or anything quite so silly. I think that we'll see a much more prudent approach. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, first, uh, given the level of concern in Washington among both parties with the relationship with China, um, I think it's very unlikely that the Biden administration would drop tariffs against China uh, without a substantial quid pro quo. They won't do it just out of goodwill or to say, well, we wouldn't have done it if we were in power. They're there, um, they are leverage against the Chinese government. And if there are to be dropped, I think that we would expect, and the Biden administration would expect substantial Chinese concessions. So I don't think that's going to, to change. I think that the strategic approach towards China may be what we see rather than a sort of a piecemeal approach where the US sort of pokes at different major trading partners individually, you know, sort of ignoring the old Clausewitz dictum of not avoiding two front wars. Rather, it would make a lot more sense, and I think the Biden administration incoming folks are aware of it, to have a multilateral approach where the US and other major trading partners of China kind of get together and talk about and work together on uh, dealing with China. I think that's more effective. Usually China responds better to this kind of a multilateral approach rather than sort of fighting an omnidirectional trade war against all our major trading partners at once. Um, I think also this multilateralism we can expect would mean maybe you know, better treatment of allies by the United States. As Ambassador Fujisaki said, um, Prime Minister Abe was a magician in dealing with President Trump. Did a remarkable job of managing the relationship, understood the man, understood what was important to the United States. I think that was terrific. And you know, in a way it's lamentable that he is no longer on the scene simply because um, you know, he really exerted his mastery of the US-Japan relationship. Hopefully um, as sort of his understudy, Prime Minister Suga will be able to do the same. Um, but I think more broadly with the sort of transactional nature of the relationships that we've had with major allies, I think that's going to be transformed. I think if I were in Seoul right now, I'm sure the Koreans would be very happy uh, to anticipate that there wouldn't be as heavy an emphasis on you know, renegotiating host nation support to uh, you know, quadruple or what have you. I think that you know, it'll be more of a two-way flow of influence and information. Um, Ambassador Fujisaki talked about the Quad um, and you know, the free Indo-Pacific concept. I think it's useful to remember that Prime Minister Abe is really the one that came up with it. So it wasn't really a Trump thing. It was a Japan thing, it was an Abe thing. 
I think it is uh, a very useful uh, function, but it is limited. Um, we, should, we should recall, for example, that when Prime Minister Abe came out with the Osaka Initiative for free cross-border data flow, that India stood in the way and rejected this. Um, India's position on forced localization of data and really its antipathy, you could say almost to free cross-border data flow kind of about in the way. So there's an example of how, you know, really operationalizing the quad is going to be a challenge. It is definitely worth pursuing, but uh, we definitely have to do a lot of work on that. And the US and Japan could work and should work together on that. I also agree with Ambassador Fujisaki that we should be putting more focus on ASEAN and the Southeast Asian region, uh, region in general. Um, it's been disappointingly undervalued and neglected in recent years. We haven't even shown up at their meetings. I mean, talk about yielding the field. And this is an increasingly important area, both for strategic reasons and of course, for reasons of trade and investment. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, we can also anticipate in the Biden administration, more of a focus on strategic and structural issues in our negotiations with China. It's not going to be, you know, buy more food substances from borderline election states and we'll be happy with you. I think it's going to be more on the strategic and structural issues in the trade relationship, the sort of ne neo-mercantile nature of China's trade policies, um, you know, forced transfer of technology, systematic cyber theft, competition on 5G, AI, the China 2025 issue, and so forth. I think those issues will be amplified by human rights concerns by the folks in the Biden administration who are naturally going to put more emphasis on it. And, you know, in the tech field, for example, there's going to be more concern, I think, demonstrated about facial recognition software and its abuses and the possible abuse for social credit scores that can really sort of be a means of suppression politically. So I think that those are some issues what we're going to encounter. Um, I don't want to uh, go over my time uh, at least too terribly much, but um, let me also say that uh, in terms of negotiations vis-a-vis -vis trade and especially concerning Japan, uh, remember now that the Biden administration folks have said that labor and especially environmental issues are going to be important in trade agreements, that US competitiveness is going to be something they focus on and that it'll be a foreign policy for the middle class. And what does that mean? Well, you know, uh, incoming President Biden has said that any trade negotiations must have labor and environmental folks represented at the table. Now, does that mean that we will have the EPA and, um, you know, um, the Secretary of Labor perhaps sitting there in the negotiations when we talk about a bilateral trade treaty with Japan? I don't know. But um, certainly we could question whether uh, to rejoin CPTPP, the US would say, well, we have to renegotiate things that affect labor and the environment and so forth. Now it's not impossible. The USMCA went through with some amendments along those lines, but it will complicate things because there'll be different priorities. Um, again, organized labor being a key Biden ally. Um, another question in my mind, um, is the role that uh, former Secretary of State Kerry will play. A very intelligent man, very well versed, uh, but with a very narrow and focused uh, portfolio this time around, isn't it? On um, the environment. And he's going to be sitting on the National Security Council. Will he even have a cabinet seat? It bears watching very closely to see how much of a role environment is going to play in concrete negotiations that the US conducts with other trading partners. Um, for example, um, how much staff will Kerry have? Where will he be located? Um, these things are worth asking. When he negotiated the Iran agreement, if you recall, um, Secretary Kerry was very single-minded on the nuclear component. And the agreement was criticized by some because, well, first of all, intrinsic issues such as these um, sunset clauses that made the whole thing fade away were harshly criticized. But there was also the question 
that Iran was going to get a bundle of money and other issues such as its aggressive posture in the Middle East, support for terrorism, et cetera, were not being addressed. So if uh, Secretary Kerry is now focused on environment and let's say negotiations with China, does not not give China a lot of leverage because we need to get China to cooperate if we're really going to make the Paris Accord functional, China was going to have to do a lot more than it's signed up to do. And, you know, in any trade negotiation, you have to give to get. So if we're going to be um, incorporating it to such a high level, just remember, we're going to be giving the Chinese a lot of leverage in that area. And we may have to pay in other areas for that bilateral negotiation. It's worth keeping an eye on. Um, you know, the, um, uh, I should also say that, um, you know, on the energy front, make a very brief comment that um, President Biden, President-elect Biden, uh, while he has not disavowed fracking, he's definitely got a lot of people in his government and his party who are opposed to it, and it will come under pressure. And we can imagine that that may have an effect on the potential for the U.S. to supply allied energy needs, including those for Japan. Um, there will be pressure on coal, most certainly, and we remember uh, Hillary Clinton's words about killing the coal industry. Um, we wonder about the support for the nuclear industry in the new administration as well, but we can imagine that there would be a lot more focus on renewables, electric cars, green energy, and so forth. Remember, there's a whole wing of the party that wants a Green New Deal. So uh, this is going to have an impact also on, uh, on industry, I believe. And, uh, you know, again, finally, just to make the point about uh, human rights, um, I mean, it's, it's heartening in a way, isn't it, that uh, the administration is going to take a much more focused approach to the importance for human rights and sort of showing that the United States is you know, the, the shining city on the hill, as Reagan described it, and in trying to promote human dignity, human rights throughout the world. Um, and it will, of course, at the same time, complicate relationships with certain countries that are important to us. Obviously, it will complicate relations between the US and China, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, just domestically, uh, period but it will also complicate relationships that matter um, among friends of the United States, authoritarian tilting regimes. For example, um, it may complicate relations with the Philippines or Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, you know, this has an impact, of course, on the energy sector and some diplomatic initiatives as well. So I think I'll end it there, and I hope I haven't run too much over my time. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to present some views on what we might expect of the Biden administration. What a terrific uh, encapsulation, Dr. Thomas Sinkin. Um, it's really great to get some insight from you. And um, I'm going to ask uh, Ambassador Fujisaki to comment on whatever points in your presentation struck his, uh, his fancy. But before I do that, for those attendees who have signed on perhaps late, um, Boy, this is a, a great briefing to get. Please recall that this um, session will be recorded. It is being recorded. And it is part of a series of, of uh, webinars that we will be hosting on the US-Japan relationship and the things that are going on in Washington, DC or elsewhere in the world geopolitically that impact what we are doing here in Japan. Uh, secondly, let me remind you that we have a Q&A portion towards the end of this session, and I apologize that we, we cram everything into one hour, but if you have a question and you would like to be uh, the question to be attributed to you, please put that in the comment box, but we are getting a lot of comments now and we'll try to address those. If you are with the press, you will receive a little bit of a priority on that, so please fill that in now. We've got another five, uh, 10 minutes before we will hit the questions and answers. Ambassador Fujisaki, is there anything that uh, uh, Dr. Sinkin said that uh, particularly um, strikes you as, as something that requires a little bit more elucidation. Thank you very much. Uh, as for uh, US-China relations, I think uh, what Dr. Sinkin has said uh, is the mainstream uh, 
a sort of uh, analysis, uh, both in the United States and Japan, and I hope it's right. Uh, but maybe the reason I have a little doubt on that still is that uh, maybe I'm old fashioned in a way, and I still remember my days uh, in Washington. Uh, is, uh, the lot of argument uh, I heard that time was that, uh, hey, uh, we have uh, 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 accepted uh, China into WTO, and uh, we hope that uh, China will uh, grow as a more democratic country from that. Uh, Japanese were saying, hey, it's not that. Uh, you have opened the uh, cap of Aladdin's lamp. Genie has come out. Uh, genie will not follow the human kind, uh, the other people's uh, rules. Uh, they have their rules and uh, once you're out, it's out. Uh, they, uh, and it's natural because uh, if you let the, uh, some uh, econo uh, huge population with uh, cheap labor come out, uh, then uh, that'll uh, logically produce genie. And uh, however, uh, 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 that argument was not much heard and uh, was, we were told that, hey, uh, your neighbors, you better make better relations with your neighbors. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, that was uh, that kind of argument was uh, prevailing for quite a long time up until the very late Obama or beginning of Trump. So still, maybe I'm a little obsessed with the reset idea. Uh, I understand logic that uh, the world is different, but uh, I think uh, uh, more often than not, polit politicians want to come up with something new. Uh, and uh, China is now really uh, waiting for uh, uh, this golden, op have waited for this golden opportunity. So this is the reason. And uh, I completely share Dr. Sinkin's view. And uh, that's the uh, uh, mainstream view here in Japan as well. But uh, uh, I'm telling my colleagues, you, you can uh, listen to that, but don't sleep on that. Uh, there could be changes as well. Uh, re remember what happened uh, 50 years ago when you saw on the screen uh, Nixon and Kissinger was in Beijing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, um, we've been through this before, the change of administration, and uh, plenty that happens afterwards really takes us um, by surprise and there's a, a, a great change in, in theme and, and direction. Uh, Dr. Sinkin, do you have um, anything to add? Uh, uh, can I add some more? Sure. Uh, uh, when, when you said that uh, uh, we went to, uh, uh, we agreed with uh, President Clinton and uh, 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 agreed on establishing KEDO and uh, giving uh, North Korea uh, a nuclear power plant uh, uh, Mr. Bush came out and said no and uh, told us to let's go to Iraq. Uh, we went. Mr. Obama said uh, Iraq war was wrong. Yeah. Let's do TPP in Paris. Yeah. Uh, we did uh, Paris and TPP and Mr. Trump denied everything. And uh, Mr. Biden is saying that, hey, let's do TPP. Well, uh, no, Paris and Iraq, uh, not TPP, but uh, Paris and Iraq. So. I think it's all right uh, if the uh, United States uh, is the uh, uh, disc jockey. They play the music and we dance. Uh, sometimes they ask for salsa, sometimes uh, they ask for uh, waltz, and uh, we all dance with that. And now uh, tr uh, Mr. Trump uh, uh, said uh, salsa was, is over and Mr. Biden's uh, waltz time is coming and I think we'll dance with it. That's not Jap only Japan, the rest of the world, but we have to always remember that music can change when the new president uh, comes in. When uh, Mr. Biden's term is over, maybe new music is going to be played. Uh, I'm sorry to take a long time, but uh, that's how I feel. Absolutely. It's it's all rock and roll once again. <laughs> Dr. Sinkin? 
Oh, well, um, first on that, um, that comment about dancing, let's just hope it's not the Macarena. <laughs> Lots of motion and no forward movement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, one of the things um, that you said that really struck me, um, Ambassador Fujisaki, is this trust issue. You know, is the United States there for us? Can we rely on you? And one of the, the major signals of that, that trust or that, that um, foundation is the uh, appointment of the uh, US ambassador to Japan. And um, everybody is, is anxious and eager to hear that. But I also reflect on your, your initial comment when you first started talking about it's like Christmas, you know, you have a present, you don't wanna guess what the present is, you just wanna be surprised and very grateful when you open the present. So it is a little bit premature to, to talk about it, but it is an is issue of, of really supreme importance to us who, who are doing business here and living here. Who is going to be our ambassador? Do we have access? Is it the kind of person that can represent our interests and also have a, the ear of the, the president? And um, I'd like to just uh, touch on that. I think I know you probably talk about Christmas presents again, but I would like to, to tee that up because it is an important issue that's on everybody's minds. Uh, reportedly, uh, we are sending a new uh, ambassador to Washington as well. Uh, I just read in the newspaper a few days ago, and uh, uh, he was uh, my deputy when I was in Washington, and a great guy. I hope that's uh, going to be true. As for the United States, uh, we really don't know, because uh, uh, that's the relations with the uh, president. Uh, and uh, one thing I learned uh, uh, was that uh, Ambassador to Japan is a uh, sort of uh, uh, one of the most uh, 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 important uh, position for U.S. Uh, politicians. Uh, Speaker of the House, Vice President, uh, and uh, Senate Majority Leader. None of them have gone to in, any other country than Japan. Uh, we had uh, two speakers of the House. One, uh, as one Speaker of the House, uh, Foley, two uh, Senate Majority Leader Baker and uh, Mansfield and Mondale, uh, Vice President. And uh, I, I think it's very, uh, uh, very uh, important for American politicians uh, because uh, two reasons. One, uh, there's lots of things to work. It's not a, uh, just a, a ceremonial job, uh, economy uh, and uh, security issues. Secondly, we treat ambassadors very well. Uh, the Imperial House and all that. Uh, it's a, uh, not like uh, some uh, communist country or whatever, uh, but uh, we uh, regard it very well. Uh, I'm not referring to any other country. And uh, so when uh, I was appointed ambassador uh, to the United States 12 years ago, some of my, of my American friends said, hey, you're very lucky to be ambassador in Washington. And I said, yes, I'm very lucky, I'm very happy. If I had a choice, I'd rather be ambassador of the United States to Japan, <laughs> but uh, that's a joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think um, being in Washington DC and being um, pretty much embedded in the whole process there, uh, Dr. Sinken, you, you might have a little bit more of a, a strong position or maybe actual relationships or insight into the individuals who would be in consideration. Can you share any of that with us? Um, in a word, no. <laughs> I'm afraid, you know, this is one of those instances where there's a slight chance that if I throw the dart at the dartboard, <laughs> I'll accidentally hit the right target. <laughs> I mean, there are the usual suspects, you could yes. say. Um, you know, I remember once uh, Joe Nye, the eminent Joe Nye, was rumored as almost certain to be ambassador to Japan and he was not selected, for example. Right. I think that's when the John Roos was selected, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to predict. I agree with Ambassador Fujisaki. I really like the idea of having somebody who's a real, you know, omono, some, you know, really um, significant political figure to go to Tokyo to emphasize the relationship. I remember when Ambassador uh, Fritz Mondale was there on the scene, asking him once, well, you know, um, you talk with your old colleagues in the Senate very often. 
And he said, yeah, he's in regular contact with about a quarter of them. And I thought, oh my God, he's in touch with 25 senators on a regular basis. Now, I, I, you know, you'd be hard pressed to come up with too many other uh, ambassadors who are able to just pick up the phone and call 25, you know, a quarter of the Senate at any given time. And uh, it was a real testimony um, to the selection of uh, such a, an eminent personality uh, to be an ambassador. So I'm hopeful that we'll come up with somebody of, of uh, stature that will honor, you know, what uh, Ambassador Mansfield used to describe as uh, the most important relationship in the world, bar none. And which I might add that Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense, uh, was in discussing it during his visit to Tokyo, said, well, in Europe, we have NATO. And in Asia, we really have just Japan. Right. And so, you know, um, I think that uh, for the Biden administration to start moving forward with a more multilateral approach and one that emphasizes allied relationships more, it would be uh, certainly taken very well in Tokyo to send somebody of stature. Right, I, I agree. Um, it is awful hard to throw those darts and the calculus of, of appointing the ambassador, I mean, it's so huge, but a lot of things go into it, but it is of, of keen interest to everybody who's involved and I think everybody who's in on, on this call. With that, I'd like to close this portion of it and move into the Q&A. We've got plenty of Q&A, uh, some with attribution, uh, some that are directed at either uh, Dr. Sinken or Ambassador Fujisaki. So what I'd like to do is just uh, start going through those questions as, as quickly as possible. And if, um, if they're identified to one of the speakers, please use your time to, to talk on that. And if it's the other uh, party who has, wasn't identified, if you have something else to throw in, please take the opportunity to do that. So with that, I'd like to lead off with a question we received from uh, Eric Leinhardt from the uh, Slovak Embassy here in uh, Tokyo. He wants to know once again, um, the situation with the Biden approach to TPP. We touched on it briefly. Could you elucidate just a little bit more, uh, Dr. Sinkin, on what the pro prognosis is? Well, I don't have much more to add, although I appreciate the question. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there certainly has to be a recognition among many in Washington that, that some in the Biden administration and coming Biden administration will share that the TPP is essential to get the U.S. back in the game uh, and to help serve as not only a useful economic mechanism, but also one that can serve as an alternative um, in Asia to countries that are being sort of drawn inexorably into China's economic orbit. I don't mean to sound that to sound sinister. I just mean to sound, you know, uh, practical about it. So for the U.S. to maintain its influence, and again, not even being an ARSA, um, it seems that uh, some version of a multilateral agreement along those lines might be well worth considering. And I'm sure there are those in the Biden administration that think that, perhaps Joe Biden himself. But on the other hand, you know, again, look at the history. Um, organized labor has uh, rightly got some, you know, skeptical views about any trade agreement, let alone a multilateral trade agreement. They came out very strongly against TPP. Um, they told Hillary Clinton, you know, if you want our active support, you know, going to the polls, bringing people to the polls, signs or door to door, then you're going to have to ditch TPP. And she did. It's a lot of pressure to be brought to bear by an important constituency of the Democratic Party. And again, you know, it doesn't mean that Joe Biden can't reverse the party's position on TPP, but it would take a lot of uh, political capital, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, going to like each district and showing members of Congress and their constituents how that particular district would benefit. And that's the kind of level of, uh, of uh, you know, work, you know, uh, field work that I think might be necessary. And is that the priority for the president? He's got so many other things to worry about. Right. As Ambassador Fujisaki was mentioning, you know, COVID-19, for example, getting the economy back in shape. So I'm not sure that that's, uh, that's not going to be a little bit down the road before it can be seriously considered, unfortunately. 
Thank you very much. I hope that responds to your question, Eric. Um, Ambassador Fujisaki, do you have anything to add to that? And if not, then I can roll on to the next question. Okay. Um, you know, politics is all about memory and uh, there are long-term memories. You were in Washington DC during uh, the Obama Biden administration and there are probably things that were done or not done that produced some um, negative consequences that perhaps uh, a President Biden would like to readdress. Those kinds of things just stick in your mind, but they are uh, very predictive for us. Is there anything that sticks in your mind about what things he might want to redo or to, to address in a, in a way now that he is the President of the United States? Um, uh, yes, I'm sorry, I can't read his mind, but uh, one thing I'd like to say is that uh, in this country, in Japan, there's a myth that, hey, Republican parties were good to Japan than Democratic Party. And uh, that's because uh, Nakasone and Reagan was good, Koizumi and Bush was good, Abe and Trump was good. But it's a very, very shallow analysis. Some journalist has written it uh, 15 years ago, and I was very much against it. And uh, I, I'm telling my friends, hey, who came to Japanese prime minister's funeral? There's only one. Mr. Clinton came to Mr. Obuchi's funeral, 2000. Uh, what happened during Obama? March 311 Tomodachi operation, his Hiroshima visit, he was the first one to say that the Senkaku is covered by the article five of the uh, security as uh, treaties. So uh, it's an exaggeration to say that, hey, uh, uh, Republican parties were better than democratic parties to Japan. And uh, one uh, thing that uh, was a little unfortunate was that uh, during the, uh, around 2010, we had so many prime ministers change every year. When I was in Washington, for four and a half years. I had five prime ministers, five Japanese prime ministers, six foreign ministers. And it's very difficult to develop relations if you change every year. So it's not only uh, Mr. Obama or Mr. Biden's uh, fault, but it's, I think uh, we had uh, too many changes as well. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Biden uh, knew that hey, it's important to reassure Japan in the sec Senkaku security issues. So he came up as Dr. Sinkin said in the first telephone conference. And I think that was very effective. And uh, I really look forward to seeing uh, a lot of uh, cooperation between the two countries under him. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fujisaki. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Thomas Sinkin. And I apologize to everyone who is on, on this call. We just don't have enough time. We've got plenty other great questions that uh, we just can't address. But um, time is, uh, is limited and we, want to, we need to wrap this up. We will be teeing up yet another webinar in the very near future as um, uh, uh, Dana Marshall uh, identified earlier. And I'd just like to turn the table over to uh, Dana now for the closing comments. Thank you very much everyone for participating. Thank you very much. It was great to have. It's always great to be there. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Dana? Uh Thanks. Thank you very much, Tim. And let me thank Ambassador Kujisaki and Dr. Sinkin for those really excellent presentations and all of you for your questions. And I know it's frustrating that we cannot get to all of them, uh, but we can try to share those questions with, with our speakers and see if there's some way we may be able to get back uh, to you on them. Uh, some of you may know that the late, great New York Yankees uh, pitch, uh, catcher, Yogi Berra, was also a practical philosopher with an endless supply of notable quotes. Perhaps anticipating tonight's discussion, he once said, the future ain't what it used to be. Certainly the future of US-Japan relations and with the rest of Asia is definitely not what then Vice President and his team anticipated when they left office. The President-elect is assuring the world that America is back and is ready to leave the world, not retreat from it. That of course is the classic multilateral internationalist American mission statement. But the, the uh, president-elect and his team know 
that it needs to be pursued very differently now. The new administration will need to restore America's own democracy, rebuild our middle class, strengthen competitiveness, and calibrate America's international initiatives with American resources and priorities. A successful American foreign and international economic policy will need to balance an assertive China, deal with less sway in multilateral institutions, and reduced enthusiasm for democracy in many nations around the world. <clears throat> Let's not forget <clears throat> that it will need to interpret why over 74 million Americans voted to keep President Trump in office. And all of this in the context of dealing with the pandemic and the need to reopen the economy. So while this incoming administration poses many fewer uncertainties, perhaps that is counterbalanced by the many more around the world. We look forward to keeping in touch with all of you on these and other matters of mutual interest in the uh, Biden, as the Biden administration takes shape. And in the meantime, and on behalf of our speakers and our two firms, let me wish uh, you all the very best for happy and healthy holidays and a very much better 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Nice to see you.